By my second term, the British had once again begun to increase the harmful effects of their dominance of the sea. In May of 1806, this is my second term now of presidency, the British conflict with Napoleon was growing in its intensity. Fox's blockade set into motion on May 16th of 1806, cut off our trade with anywhere along the French coastline. But the British did not limit their depredations of our independence to the coastline of Europe. They assaulted us on our own coastline. The following year, on June 22nd of 1807, the British HMS Leopard fired on the USS Chesapeake off the coast of Norfolk, Virginia, in our waters. Though we actually weren't quite sure whether they were our waters, or rather, we couldn't quite prove that they were our waters because we hadn't measured them yet. So our claim to them was at best a little vague. And I'm afraid that the battle, as it were, that ensued wasn't much of a battle at all and did not redound well to the honor of the commander of the Chesapeake, the United States ship, one James Barron. His frigate was caught unprepared completely. There were ropes on the deck, sails still tied to the masts. He managed to fire only one shot before he surrendered to the leopard. The Leopard's crew then boarded the Chesapeake in search of deserters from the British Navy. In an odious undertaking known as impressment, the British took four U.S. crew members, eventually hanging one of them under the charge of his abandonment of his duties in the British Navy. The affair took a prominent place in the course of events that eventually led to what you now refer to the War of 1812. We, we didn't call it the War of 1812. It's generally not how people name wars when they're in them. The most common term used for it was the war for free trade and commerce. Or free trade, one of, one of the mottos for it was free trade and sailors' rights. There's actually a song from the period, don't ask me to sing it, I'm, I'm no singer. I hear that I've been uh, depicted in song and dance and rhythmic metered uh, chant in your day, but uh, you can't expect that from me. Free trade and sailors' rights. Free trade and commerce. That's what defined the war, and it was often called the war for those things. Because we had not yet even become competent at the seas, much less mastered them enough. This was defining our international relations and our national pride. Well, back to the story of the incident between the Leopard and the Chesapeake. Our commander, Baron, was court-martialed for his behavior in the episode, as if obstinately making new mistakes could possibly eradicate the stain of original mistakes. Baron later killed U.S. naval hero Stephen Decatur, in a duel that resulted from Decatur's comments regarding the incident of the Chesapeake and the Leopard. Decatur had been one of the officers who presided over Barron's court martial. In early 1807, I had rejected a treaty that William Pinckney and James Monroe had negotiated with the British because the treaty did not stop British impressment of our soldiers, didn't even address it. The confrontation between the Leopard and the Chesapeake not only served to emphasize the need to bring an end to the British dominance of our maritime affairs, it also brought into stark clarity the fact that we were not in control of our own coastlines. We didn't even know what they were. Quite literally, we didn't know where they were. That sounds obvious. Where's the coastline? Well, there's the ocean, so just a little bit in from there. No, we did not know where the inlets were. We had no maps. We had a few. an essential missing tool in our gaining control of our coastlines and therefore of our being able to defend our nation was an understanding of that coastline. We didn't know the shape of the coasts of failure that put out offense efforts in bad shape indeed. Because of the Lewis and Clark expedition along the Missouri River and the Columbia River that had happened, uh, completed the year before in 1806, and Thomas Freeman's exploration up the Red River and Ze Zebulon Pike's documenting the Northern Mississippi as well as trying to find the terminus of the Red River, that didn't work out as well for him. More was known about the unsettled West than about the Eastern coastline of the United States. It was in light of all this that Representative Samuel W. Dana of Connecticut introduced a resolution for survey of the coastline. In doing so, the Congressman noted that limited charts of North Carolina and Long Island Sound had been made, but very little more. He also stressed that a coastline survey would be essential in designating maritime boundaries, thus discouraging belligerent searches and sieges off the U.S. coast. A bill passed quickly through both houses with little debate, overcoming sectional rivalries with potential benefits to the entire Atlantic and U.S. Gulf Coast. On February 10th of 1807, I proudly signed into law an act to provide 
for surveying coasts of the United States. Americans understood the most powerful weapon for our nation's defense is knowledge of and adherence to objective reality, more cogently expressed by the single word science. This realization that a trust in science was an essential tool brought us together as one people with shared boundaries. On this sentiment, I had written in 1800 that the votaries of science, however widely dispersed, however separated by religion, by allegiance or vocation, form but one family. Like any family, unfortunately, we still squabbled with one another. Having been delayed by the War of 1812, the first survey work began in August of 1816. The first lawsuit against the survey began one month later. The work of that first survey ceased by the end of that same November due to funding issues, but we had finally begun the long overdue task. As I've already mentioned, there's precious little in your day that I will discuss. I am proud, however, to cast my eyes forward across the millennia for a moment in our discussion to let you know that part of my legacy, indeed one of the proudest parts, is the United States Geodetic Survey. It is the oldest scientific agency in the United States government, dating back to its birth in 1807, as the United States Survey of the Coast. Freedom is the firstborn daughter of science. I wrote to Robert Patterson in 1802, but besides the utility of the immediate discovery, no discovery is barren. It always serves as a step to something else. The US survey of the coast eventually led to the creation of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration with its clever and appropriate acronym, NOAA. I am honored that you have judged my legacy something worth attending to today. And for what it's worth, I am proudest of those aspects of my legacy that encourage future generations of Americans to learn more and understand their world better than the generations that came before them. NOAA and its inceptionary agency, the US National Geodetic Survey, represent living examples of what I most wished to bestow upon future generations of America to wit, ever-expanding enlightenment. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. That ideas should freely spread from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man an improvement of his condition seems to have been peculiarly and benevolently designed by nature when she made them like fire, expansible over all space, without lessening their density in any point, and like the air in which we breathe, move, and have our physical being, incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation. And I contemplate the immense advances in science and discoveries in the arts which have been made within the period of my life. I look forward with confidence to equal advances by the present generation and have no doubt they will consequently be as much wiser than we have been, as we than our fathers were, and they than the burners of witches.